Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of In the Prog Seat. It's Tuesday night. It's album study night. And we have a very, very special guest for today's show. The album in question, picked by Mr. Ken Golden, is Renaissance's Scheherazade and other stories. And with us today is Miss Annie Haslam. Welcome, Annie. Welcome. Thank you. Good to have you back on Sea of Tranquility once again. Yeah, yeah, when a couple of years ago, was it during the pandemic? It was during the pandemic. It was, wasn't it? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. That was uplifting at a sad time. Yeah, that was good. No, exactly. So we figured, uh, why not bring someone who knows this album quite well to help us in our album study? And Annie will hopefully bring lots of color commentary to the album and the songs as Ken who picked this particular album, is going to host the episode. Let me just introduce everybody real quick. We've got, of course, Lewis Nasser is here. Chad Hudson is in the house. Anthony Farrar is in the house. And all the way from New York City, Mr. Chuck Alvarez. What's up, everybody? Greetings. Hello, Chuck. Greetings. Hello. Hello, Annie. So with that, I'm going to, as we do in these album studies, uh, this is Ken's pick. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to Ken to drive this episode. He's got uh, some things to talk about the album, questions to ask us, and I'm assuming questions for Annie as well. And yeah. we're going to, we're going to have everybody be highly engaged in this particular conversation. That's why we brought Annie here. So uh, hopefully you'll get not only our opinions, but lots of factoids and things about the album from Annie herself. So with that, Ken, I'll turn it over to you. So, Annie, please correct correct all our errors. My memory is not as good as it used to be. <laughs> I've just got to remember not to be naughty when I say I'm pretty you kind can, of. You can make stuff up. We don't care. <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't. We wouldn't know the difference. So that's okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a little trip down memory lane. Mm -hmm. When uh, when it was my time to pick an album, I thought let's talk about Renaissance. My first Renaissance show was at Radio City, 1977. Sea level opened up. They were terrible, but you guys were great. <laughs> it was, that was that was a great show. And I and over the years, I saw Renaissance. I I grew up in New York City, Annie, so I got to see you perform many many times over the years. And I, did you see the one when we came up in the in the, the yellow cab? We played that there twice. Yeah, I think that was, I think that was, I think that's when I saw you. So it was the novella tour. I don't remember. Well, you know what? I, I can't remember. I don't remember either. either. Yeah. So if you don't remember, I... <laughs> yeah. But I saw you some strange places, the North Stage, out on Long Island, Glen Cove. I... Don't say my father's place. Remember I saw you at my father's place. Did you really? Yeah. You had short hair. Who? You did. You have very short hair. No, yeah, short. never had short hair. Well, it was the go. wasn't the timeline. Errors, wasn't dude. that like the wasn't that the timeline album? Oh well, the timeline. Uh, well, that was the last time we played there. That I think my father's place was the first tour we were we did as well. So my hair was all long then, but I think it yeah. was a bit shorter. I think we played there years and years later. Yeah, that must have been in the eighties then. Yeah. Yeah. So I got to see I got to see you perform a lot. So right. so you perform acoustic with uh, Steel Eye Span and Fairport Convention. I think that was at the Beacon Theater. Oh, that was a great combination, wasn't it? Yeah. A bounce. It really worked well. You know, there was no egos at all. It was just wonderful. Everybody got on well, and sometimes somebody else, you know, somebody would uh, headline, and then we'd swap over, and there was no never any problems. That was really interesting. We did that acoustically. Uh, well, you were like semi-acoustic. Was they it John, were... John Camp, me, Michael Dunford. Yeah, I think Rave was on keyboards. I think. No, Maybe. no, Rave, Maybe. Rave wasn't in the Rave wasn't there then. No, no. I, I, as Pete would say, I got a case of the olds. So I know. <laughs> Join the club. It was a long time ago, but anyway, I did. You know, anyway, I, that's my trip down memory lane. So right. uh, I'm a, I'm a big fan. And it was time to pick an album. And it just happened that I had listened to Scheherazade uh, not that long ago. And it popped into my head. I thought, you know, it's not my favorite Renaissance album. But I think in some ways 
it's the most ambitious Renaissance album. And I thought it would be, I, I thought, you know, Ashes Are Burning, Turn of the Card, it's kind of low-hanging fruit. I mean, they're, you know, they're brilliant and everybody knows them. But I think that this album needs a little digging into. And uh, as I said, a little more ambitious. And I thought this would be a little more interesting to talk about. So uh, just background, uh, the album was recorded in 1975. You had Tony Cox conducting the London Symphony Orchestra, correct? And uh, three tracks on the first side. And then we had the big song of Scheherazade uh, suite on side two. Trip to the Fair opens up with a kind of very ethereal piece. John Tout playing electric piano. Uh, and uh, more of like, a, I, I, would, I wouldn't call it a folk piece, but it's... It's a softer piece, softer in tone, almost, uh, almost as I said, ethereal. Uh, kind of has like a kind of very dreamy quality to me. And Annie, is is it true that according to Wikipedia, that that was based on your first date with Roy Wood? It was, but wasn't it the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra? I don't know. According, well, according to the the it's, it's, it's possible. The it says. It says Tony Cox, and it, it talks about the L, it says the LSO. Really? Yeah, Gosh. I think so. Okay. I could be wrong. I've but, forgotten that. Well, if it says it there, then that's that's it. You know, I'm wrong a lot. So, later, no, but know, later on, we, we yeah, we use them um, a lot, and I use them. Yeah, that was my first uh, date with Roy. Um, <clears throat> we were let's see. We were record. We were recording. I think um, Scheherazade, weren't we? And we had some time off, and we had, a, I think, a week off or something. And and Dick Plant, who was the engineer at Delaney Studios, said, "Annie said, um, are you doing anything on your days off? Why didn't you come down and meet Roy Wood?" I said, I know, "He said, I know you're just gonna get on like a house on fire because you've both got a stupid sense of humor, you know, and everything." And um, so I went down there, and that was it, straight away. You know, never stopped laughing for four years. It was amazing. <laughs> and so, so Betty Thatcher wrote the lyrics. Betty wrote the lyrics. Um, she wrote you know, several of the songs about about me. Uh, um, and um, this this one time, I I called her up and I said I, I was going out uh, on a date with Roy, and uh, she said, "Will you call me the next day uh, and let me know how it went." And so uh, we went with Dick Plant and his wife Annie, another Annie. Uh, we went to Trader Vic's, and oh. that was that was underneath the Grosvenor Hotel in Park Lane. Do you remember those? You had them over here, didn't you, Trader Vic's? Trader, yeah. They must yeah. have started out over here. Oh sure. And so I remember going there. Uh, he picked me up, and we went there, and um, we. It was absolutely mad. I was. I, I. I'll never forget that place. It's one of my favorite places I've ever been to. It's just the atmosphere. It was like you were in like the Polynesian islands, you know. Um. And so Roy likes a good drink. So you know, we we um, started off with these giant fish bowls full of um, uh, white rum. What do you call them? A scorpion. They were called a scorpion, and they had a, a, a gardenia floating on the top, and they were very strong. I think I had three, and, oh. and I was legless. <laughs> we were all legless, actually. We had such a great time, and we were the last ones. Like a, a, a lot of times with Roy, well, all of us, you know, anybody that's with Roy, we'd, we'd have such a good time. We were usually the last ones to leave the restaurant, and so we left. And then we thought, well, what do we do now? You know, because we were all fired up and um, bickled. Uh, <laughs> So I said, oh, there's a there's a fair on Hampstead Heath. And so it must have been Easter time, I'm thinking. And um, so we went up, um, we drove up to Hampstead Heath. And when we, when, when we were driving, approaching it, we could see it was all closed and everything. There was nothing there. It was completely dead. And so when I called Betty the next day, that's what I told her. I said, well, you know, we went to the fair and there was nobody there. And that was it. Mm -hmm. I took a trip to the fair, and when I arrived, there was nobody there. You know, <laughs> simple, you know but it it turned out to be a great song. And uh, uh, one of the things um, there's a what is it? There's a, there's a part where I'm singing um, a core a, a vocalese thing, and then I 
I start I start laughing because I get it wrong. And I did I did that like three times. And they liked it so much. And I, I laughed in a different spot, like behind each other, so the three laughs. And so they kept that in there, that crazy laugh in there. That's <laughs> because it was just a mistake, really. But yeah, what what a fabulous song though. I love doing that. Very exciting. It's a great, I I think it's a great intro to the album. And it's got a jazz, a, 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 a kind of a jazz feel to it as well. Mm-hmm. Not a great, great jazz feel, but it has something to it that's different, you know. Yeah, that instrumental break is great. Yeah. So so the second track, Vulture's Fly High, I assume that has nothing to do with Roy Wood. So. No. <laughs> <laughs> but what it does have, it has a lot of John Camp on lead bass. Yes. So, and 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 John John was playing the Rickenbacker, correct? Oh gosh, yeah. What a great yeah. He's a great bass player, but yeah, the Rickenbacker. It's always been the sound of Renaissance, really. Yeah, and that's John's the thing. I mean, Rickenbacker. Yeah. And you hear John Tout's playing. He's playing some synthesizer, which he didn't play a lot of synthesizer in the band, right? Not really. No. You, usually, when he did, um, well, when we started out, I think we had a DX7. And 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 a, a grand piano or whatever we could use when we st- first started off and went to Switzerland on, on tour and we got there and they were supplying the pianos and stuff and they only had an upright piano and the stage wasn't big enough so they put these beer crates on I mean, he, he was he was playing on a on a on a on a stage made out of beer crates <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, yeah, no, he he uh and yeah, the DX7 was the first one that we used a lot. And then he had he must have had a Hammond organ because he had I remember the Leslie was a separate thing that you had with an organ, isn't it? Right. In those days. Right. I, I can't explain it because I'm not really a, I'm not a keyboard player, but and then I remember we got a CS80, and that's when we could start using that for the orchestral parts. Right, later on. Yeah. So, you know, rather than the DX7 and those, you know, of course leaps and bounces then everybody sounds like an orchestra you know so the third track ocean gypsy to me one of one of the signature pieces from renaissance Mm -hmm. one of your great great pieces uh orchestration comes a little bit more to the front song was covered by blackmore's night anthony who did it better <laughs> Renaissance. Renaissance. The correct answer. The correct answer. Correct. Actually, I'll I'll be honest, Danny. I didn't know the I didn't discover you guys till like mid two thousands, but I had the Blackmore's Night album earlier because the song was recorded like I think in ninety seven or ninety eight on their debut. So when I got Shahrazad, I was like, oh, so this is a cover. I didn't know it was well, a cover at the time. Yeah, it's odd because um uh, we were playing with my solo band, we played a place in uh, Pauling, New York. What was it called? Daryl's oh, ha- house, Annie? It's what it was. It, no, it's Daryl's house now, but it used oh, to the, be. The town, the it was town, the crier. town crier, yes. The yes. town crier. And the food was phenomenal. And it was a great place to play. Very slightly, 120 people, you know, really kind of small. But um, uh, 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 where am I going with this? What were we talking about? Oh, shit, my... Train of thought's gone. Ocean Gypsy. Ocean, Ocean Gypsy. Gypsy. Black Gypsy Black Black yes, Black I went there and I was with my ex-husband, Mark. He came up and uh, he came with us and helped me with, you know, taking the stuff and everything. He was a roadie kind of thing. Not a roadie. I wouldn't say he's a roadie, but he came to help. And so we did the show and it went really well. And and somebody said <clears throat> afterwards, did you, Richie Blackmore is in the audience. Or before we went on, I said, Oh, really? Hey, no. Anyway, so after we did the show, and I, I didn't think anything of it, and um, I got a message backstage. Richie Blackmore's outside. Do you want? Well, he wants to speak to you. So I said to my ex-husband, he's my ex-husband now, but I said to Mark, um, I said, Mark, no, I'm just going outside because he was helping with putting things away and everything. I'm going into the car park because. Richie Blackmore's out there. <laughs> he said, oh, yeah. <laughs> he didn't believe it. <laughs> and he was so angry afterwards after he left. But, yeah, he said um, he came back and he loved the band and he said, I love Ocean Gypsy and I think I'm going to record it sometime. And that's what he did. You know, it's a beautiful song. Oh, my gosh. So beautiful. Great. So now we get to side two. We have the epic. The song is Scheherazade, right? Yeah. And uh, I guess it 
the story drinks from the same well as uh, Rimsky Korsakov's Scheherazade, uh, based on Thousand One Arabian Nights. And it opens with an orchestral overture, finds the band blending in. I, and for me, it's one of the great albums where a band and an orchestra really, truly blend. You know, uh, Pete, you know, I know we always talk about Banco and Diterra. And for me, Scheherazade, it's, it's the same thing. I mean, it's it's there's there's a real marriage between the two uh i think tony cox's arrangements i think are, are fantastic um you have now that's john camp doing the the male vocals right doing the lead yes. vocals yes and uh to me that's one of the uh one of the my sore points for the album because i think that john as a lead vocalist is okay you know yeah. i don't think he would he, you know, and he harmonized well with you, but I think when he was out front, he was a little, uh, was a little tepid for my taste. Yeah, well, he did. Yeah, he didn't have a very strong voice, and it was, it, yeah. No. Did, was there ever a thought to have somebody else do the male lead vocals on that song? Well, there was nobody else in the band that could sing, really. No, so but I mean to say to have a, a guest come in or something like that, <laughs> or. Or better no, yet, I mean, I don't think I don't think John would have liked that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the you know, thing is, John, uh, you know, it's his voice. He's got an unusual voice. It's just that it, it needed some more power to it. It didn't have yeah. any power in it. Yeah. But yeah, for consideration but he, for for, uh, for you to sing those parts. But it, but it, but he plays the Sultan. You see, yeah, he plays the Sultan. But as a storyteller, instead of being like as the Sultan, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean before when he tells the story? I, I, what do you mean? I mean, it's instead of sort of like, you know, John is acting as the sultan there. Right. You have sung that part, but it's more of the, uh, you're not acting as the sultan, you're narrating as the, as the sultan, like you're telling no, but the story. It, I don't, I, it, I, it needed a man. Because mm -hmm. it, it's very, it, I think it's very strong, the beginning and that, yeah, no, I think that, yeah, I mean, he he did the best he could, you know. I mean, I don't know what else to say, really. Um, but but he was certainly one of the best bass players around, you know. It was um, great. It was awesome. Fantastic bass player. Oh my he god. Was great. Yeah. yeah. So fantastic. So um, there are recurring themes that crop up throughout the piece, and I think perhaps maybe again, maybe it could have been tightened up a little bit. I mean, it's about 25 minutes long. It's a long piece of music. So, um, but, you know, for me, it's, as as a, as a song, I think it's fantastic. Could have been tightened up a little bit overall, could have been improved a little, maybe a little bit. That's that's my... Right, you mean shortened, shortened up a little bit? Maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit. Maybe, yeah. maybe trim... So the maybe first person to say that. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> My opinion. I, you know, know. I, I, I think it's a... what you're saying because it's like in the. Um, it, it, it's funny you should say that, but in the part where the, where it's the dawn and you just hear the crickets, you think, "Oh, it's stopped." Right. And then you know, it, it, it's so that I think that the that would that could have been done differently because it, it's too, it's too long. I mean, I know that it's creating trying to create an atmosphere, but. Um, I think it was too low, and there could have been other things in there besides what what we put in. But well, one other thing I wanted to say before I start picking people here, you know, pointing fingers, well, <laughs> it's a great, great recording, and uh, you know, and uh, you know, I love my vinyl, and the British pressing I think is the best, the original British. Yeah. But uh, it's interesting because you know you run in, you start to run into an issue because of the length of the song mastering the vinyl start running into issues once you get around 24 minutes or so 23 24 minutes it's you know it, it kind of affects the bass in john's in john's case he's playing the reckenbacher which has that real trebly sound you know he does you don't get that real deep deep low resonating yeah. bass so uh it worked you know but um anyway that's my take on the album it's it's one of my favorites so um you had an incredible run of albums. I mean, very few bands I think duplicated that, that you know the, the run you had. So I'm gonna I'm gonna now turn it over to Anthony.
because I know he's <laughs> well. Hey, everybody's got everybody's got something to say. So let's see, Anthony. What do you think, man? Um, masterpiece. Well, as as I said, uh, Renaissance is a band that I discovered late, uh, probably in the mid two thousands. I think the first the first Renaissance album I ever bought, Annie, was Turn of the Cards, and that's kind of like my favorite. I you know I love when you guys do Black Flame and Mother Rush Alive, or just fantastic tunes yeah. and i think shahrazade may have been the second or third from renaissance i bought and i was immediately drawn even before i even heard it when i was reading on the back cover that it was a 23 24 epic i was immediately drawn to that uh and i love uh after playing ocean gypsy i was blown away that that was the cover that blackmore's night did in i think 1997 yeah. so uh yeah i this is one of my favorites um I, I like the opener. I think I think Tout's uh, electric piano is is, is amazing. I, I love how the, the intro. It, it's I think it's like two or three minutes, but it doesn't feel like it's two or three minutes. Four. That it's an electric piano. Seven. It's not an electric piano. It starts off with an acoustic piano. Yes, oh, acoustic. Piano. Oh, the very first chord is E minor. It's a really great, beautiful sound. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then um, the Vultures Fly High is just a nice little kind of like uh, mainstream kind of like kind of, I guess, rock tune, I guess you could say a little bit. Yeah, well, yeah, Betty wrote that about the critics that we had because we, we didn't have you know we, some of the reviews we got weren't all that brilliant around that time period. But the, some of the press were called as pompous and all that kind of which I had you know was that was that rolling stone or was that no i don't know what it was i can't remember circus <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's um but that, I, it's not my favorite i have to say i have to say um and i i'm not quite sure why i just it was t too harsh for me but, the, but then that's what it's i guess because of what it's about you know but um yeah it was too, too poppy for me as well a little bit Mm -hmm. And then, as, as as most of us have felt, I, I, even yeah, Ocean Gypsy. I was a bit is, scared with putting that in, really. To be honest, uh, Ocean Gypsy is just a beautiful, just a beautiful tune. That's 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 another big favorite. And of course, the epic is just I. I guess maybe I'm in the minority, but I think uh, Camp sounds great. I like his voice in the beginning. I I, I really do. I, I think it works well because I I'm also a big fan of uh, Kiev off of uh, the very first album you did with Renaissance. Prologue. 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 Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so I've I've always been a fan of Camp's voice. I think he's got a cool voice. I I just think it works well with the music. Right. Well, I, I mean, all together, you know, when you listen to us as a band and a group, it works. Yeah. You know. Annie, do you consider this the sixth or fourth album? Hey. <laughs> well, I mean, do, when I mean, do you consider the the you know the the original you know formation of the band, the Jane Ralph era, the Keith Ralph era? Is that you know? It's, do you consider? Oh, that a, I thought they were band? amazing. Oh my no, god! No, but I'm mean to say, like for example, do you count your hair as out as the sixth Renaissance album or the fourth Renaissance album? Oh, I see. Are you oh, I see what you mean. Uh... He's trying to get controversial. Yes, I'm trying to. I'm, you know, I'm trying to stir up a, a little uh, tempest. No, I mean, I, I, I love what they did. I mean, particularly the first album. You know, that I had, I learned back to front to get the job. You know, um, yeah. Kings and Queens is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I think that's phenomenal. When I first heard it, I thought, oh my god, how different is this? And I'm, you know, Jim is my friend as well. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. Um, I mean, it doesn't bother me. I, I mean, I'm not. I'm not thinking. Oh no! Well, I'm no. It's not. It, it's, we're separate. We're not. You know, we, we we. I wouldn't be sitting here now if it wasn't for them. So, no, I would. I would say it's the six. Then. <laughs> okay. Well, I was just asking. I mean, you know, in, in terms. I mean. No, you know. no, no, it doesn't bother me at all. I mean, I, I because I it's it's part of the whole progression of the band. You know. We've, yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Anthony, you uh, anything else? I think that's all. I, uh, and it's um, another thing about the album is it's from 1975, and they'll tell you that's my favorite year in music. So that's just like in line with all the other great records that came out that year. So, Chuck, you grew up in New York, right? Yes. And Renaissance, I mean, I think in my mind, and Annie, I'm sure will confirm this, I think, 
that their stronghold was New York and Philadelphia. Yes, right? very much so. so right. well, Mother, Mother, I used to hear Mother Russia on uh, classic rock radio even up until like probably like 2000. Um, um, I used to hear both um, the live version and the version, um, the studio version. And, and I used to always marvel at that because, you know, this is a band that, you know, that what's a, like as mentioned, the, you know, the critics were quick in a hurry to kill bands that were very, um, very, as they so-called said, pompous. But um, I I always loved Renaissance. Um, Annie, you're one of my favorite singers of all time. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, what, so that <laughs> I just think that um, just listening to um, to Shahrazad um, was never a chore for me. And so, and unlike Ken, and so I don't think that um, Shahrazad is too long whatsoever. Um, whenever I do listen to the song, and so I always try to listen to the live version of it. I just think that 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 live album at Carnegie Hall I really wish I was old enough to have been <laughs> been yeah, there it was brilliant guys. oh yeah it was you know? oh it, it's an amazing album yeah now what's a Shahrazad is my number two only behind uh, um Ashes of Burning um I I love the entire album there isn't a single song on this album that what's it that I would put on a throwaway I know that you said that you wasn't too crazy about the vulture is high I didn't mind the poppiness of it, and so I thought that it actually was a pretty well good welcome to this album. Right. Um, between the two epics that are um that are what's up that are flanking it, but um it's um Shahrazad that's one of those songs that always sticks to my core, and so almost as much as um Ashes Are Burning and you know what's that Mother Russia, you know it's up there as one of your finest hours. Oh. Uh, I I but to that. I, I said I've always told people about this album. You know, most people are not into the classics, you know. But to, but I've always felt that um this album should be more revered than what it was. And I thank Ken for actually suggesting this album over other albums, including Novella, because I think that Novella is also a very underrated album. Um, Great but album. um, it it really is. It it really is an outstanding album. And what's so that this album right here, um, what's so that I can listen to this album and I'll go on weeks just continuously to listen to this album. And Scheherazade is a fine album. And I really wish that they would play a few more things on classic rock radio, but you know, that's what we have streaming radios for. But I Chuck, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Chuck, speaking of that, and mm -hmm. Pete, maybe you have some thoughts on this. The, in New York City, the two queens of progressive rock, we had Annie Haslam, Mm -hmm. And Alison Steele. Yes. I was yeah. just going to say that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Alison Steele. She, yeah, she became a good friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she used to. Nightbird. I mean, yeah, I mean, she used to open up. She used to open up with Renaissance all the time. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, right. We were very lucky. So very fortunate. Thank you very much, Annie. I love this album. Oh, well, lovely. Thank you. Pete, what do you think? You're we muted. can't hear you. You're on mute. Sorry, I was on mute because my dog was making noise. Um, I'm a big fan of the album and of the band. Uh, I've already I've told that to Andy before. It's not my favorite Renaissance album. It's up there. It's a top three for me. I tend to go to Turn of the Cards as my favorite. That's again, that's got two songs on there that mean a lot to me. But this is an album where there's no weak moments. I will agree with Anthony. I love the vultures fly high. I think it's a fun <laughs> thing. Oh, yeah. little three that's, minute song, right? It's a little that's different, of us. <laughs> but I mean, I think your vocals were, I wish it was longer actually. Cause you know, I get mm -hmm. used to having your songs kind of yeah, be yeah. a little lengthier. And I think John's bass is killer on it. Your vocals are yeah. great on it. So I really like it. And it's, it's real catchy. Yeah. It's more of a straightforward pop song and I get that, but yeah. um, I like it. I think trip to the fair is absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, John's piano, the other John's Rickenbacker bass, your vocals, the finale of the song is just absolutely lovely. So good. Ocean Gypsy, I'll agree with Ken. I think it's one of your signature tracks. Um, just a lush, gorgeous classic. Man, the piano is just so good. Did you guys use, did, did he use a Mellotron on that song at all? No, I think he used... Um... The CSH that we had. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Yeah. You, you can kind uh, of because, hear yeah. something like that. Because yeah, because like recently, then like uh, when we did the fiftieth anniversary, we we um we did Ocean Gypsy for the, with the orchestra that we had, 
And so that was nice to hear, you know, to hear it with an orchestra, you know, it's like, oh my God. But yeah, no, I think it was a CS80 that we had gotcha. then. Okay. Yeah. Great song. Uh, I, you know, it's funny. I'm a, I'm a guitar guy and I generally favor guitar oriented music and Renaissance is one of those few bands that I love that, doesn't really feature a lot of guitar you know you you've got uh, a little bit of acoustic guitar obviously throughout a, a bunch of these albums but you know other than that you know that uh wonderful guitar it features solo. bass guitar well that's that's what i was going to say the, yeah. okay. with, with the bass guitar in this band with john's bass guitar you don't really miss electric yeah. guitar at all yeah. well, that's the in those spaces. and i think and i he for me other than your vocals and John's majestic piano, I mean, this band is was what it was and is what it is based on those bass lines. I mean, they're so yeah. important to the song mm -hmm. so and, and to the album. So just, I, I love his bass playing. Love yeah. it. Yeah, no, he's yeah. excellent. Yeah. He's That's one incredible. of the unsung bass players of the 70s, in my opinion. Yeah. Like, just, the guy was just yeah. incredible. And I love the title track. Yeah, I went backstage to see Yes um, uh, a few years ago when Chris Chris Squire was alive, and I was uh, backstage with the band. And he said, he said, Annie, you you in your bass player, um, John Camp, um, plays a Rick and Becker bass. I said, yeah. He said, wow, what a great bass player. Really? And I was John. I said, you you you've got you just got a new <laughs> fab, you know? Oh my God, because he's brilliant, you know, obviously. Mm -hmm. But he got a really great comment there. But yeah. Yeah, you know, we also um didn't give credit to Terrence Sullivan's drumming as oh uh, yeah his, his subtle drumming um all throughout all Good of these point. great albums, you know, a great rhythm section. You know, Terry, I, I listen to them. Mm -hmm. Terry, yes. yeah, mm -hmm. I was with Terry like a, a few weeks ago actually. Mm. I was with Terry, yeah, a great job, a drummer. Mm -hmm. Chad, hi. Anything from you? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> we all tend to talk too much. Over. <laughs> no, I think I think this is a wonderful album. Um uh I didn't know the title track as well as the other songs on it, so I did a lot of listening to it. And I think at, the more I listened to uh the epic, the less I thought it was too long. Um the, all the recurring themes, uh, I mean, obviously your vocals are phenomenal. Um listening more to the song, reading some background on it and kind of had it kind of pulled it all together. But um, um, my favorite on the album is Ocean Gypsy. I think it's beautiful. I think it's haunting. It's sad. Mm -hmm. um, I actually went back to the near fest recording from when uh, you guys played in 2012. Here's a little flashback for you. Um, and <laughs> the, ver <laughs> <laughs> the version of the version of Ocean Gypsy. <laughs> <there. Smuggler. laughs> the version on there is just stunning. Your vocals are just perfect. Um, even that little inflection that you give when you sing Cries No More is in there. And that just gives me chills. I love that. Um, I again I like some of the other guys like Pete and uh and Anthony. I like Vultures Fly High. It is a nice little short, straightforward, poppier song, but um, I love I'm gonna get a the, reputation now. <laughs> yeah. The way I like, I really like the way that those, uh, the verses kind of flow right into the, the, the chorus. It just, it feels, mm -hmm. it feels a little clever for a, a short, straightforward song. And I know I'm going backwards here, but then a trip to the fair, you know, it, it has the back story that you gave us. There's still, there's a, a little feeling of creepiness in it. Like you're at a, an almost like a haunted circus. And you're you talking know, about trips to the fair? Trips yeah. The fair? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It was it, it was creepy, to be honest. Yeah, it was, it was like it was the circus creepy sounds creepy. With almost like an yeah, uh, almost like a toy piano. Make it, you know, something's going to jump out at you at any time. Yeah, uh, you know, a little bit of that feeling, but yeah. it, it's. I think the the two shining moments of that. I mean, obviously, your voice is is angelic, but yeah. the opening to that is incredible, and I love the jazzy uh, instrumental bit in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, as an an album as a whole, it's it's really grown on, on me over the years. Uh, Ashes are burning is probably my favorite. Um, a song like uh, "Song for All Seasons" is still one of my favorite epics yep. you guys ever did. But Shahrazad's a great album, it's, and I'm very happy that you featured this at Nearfest when you guys played. 
Did we play us at Nearfest? Yeah, oh, yeah. Played all of Novella and all of Shahrazad. Wow. Yeah, I listened. I thought to it was Turn of the Cards and Shahrazad. It was Turn of, oh, turn sorry. of the you're Cards. Right, and right. Turn of the Cards. I'm on the wrong side of this. Now, Annie, I saw you guys play Novella in its entirety at the Keswick. 2000 it might have been the fall of 2012 like That's right before true. michael passed about a month before michael passed yeah we do yeah he died yeah that was that that was yeah because he yeah that was in the fall of 2012 yeah yeah that's right we played the whole the whole album yeah. didn't we yes because yeah. i had my brace on do you remember i had that brace because i've got the my oh, dislocated that... vertebra that's right oh yeah and, and so quick, I, had a, I was wearing a metal brace. It looked like a big necklace, actually. <laughs> quick story. I, so the, the first time I met Annie over email, when she first wanted to come to Nearfest and, and display her paintings. And we had it all set up. We were excited for her to come. We had a spot for her. And the first time I officially met her was on the phone as she's driving up and down uh, the street in Bethlehem going, where the hell do I park? There's too many people here. Where am I supposed to go? Where can I unload my stuff? Oh, oh, oh hi, Annie. Hang on a minute. <laughs> that's funny that's right i came up there and just sold my art didn't i yeah and then yeah. you came uh every year until you guys performed in 2012 and it was always an honor to host you and uh wonderful to meet you in person so many times that was a beautiful venue it was all in the center wasn't it yeah yeah well, we miss it it ain't coming back but we miss it yeah and he finds someplace other than the keswick to perform i hate going there <laughs> really? I don't like the sound of the Keswick. Yes, Annie, please arrange your I'm schedule Ken. around Ken's. I'm very, I'm very important. <laughs> so I'm very important. Ken, can you put a couple of your millions into the uh, Keswick to remodel it? That would help. Yes, my <laughs> millions. <laughs> my millions. <laughs> move, move the decimals a few points. Oh, so, it's a great place to work, though, really. I mean, they're fantastic people, everything about it for us. You don't like the sound? No, it's dead. Well, I'm going to go see Al Demilio. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, they, they changed the sound system, didn't they? Yeah. Chad and I are going to go see Al Demiola there soon, in a few yeah. weeks. What, in October? Al Demiola. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so now it's Luis's turn. And he's really, Annie, I just want you to know, he's much nicer than he looks. <laughs> he really is. <laughs> no, but when he says much, it's this much. <laughs> And he's smart too. You wouldn't know it by looking at him. All right. A resident I, um, and musician. I'm gonna say a few words. Um just <laughs> okay. Everybody I am ready. not, I am not, I was never a Renaissance fan. The first time I ever heard the band was at Nearfist 2012. I also have to confess that when that went down, at the time you guys hit the stage, I was I wasn't drinking scorpions, but I had drunk a copious <laughs> amount of whiskey. And at that point in time, I was not in the mood for the pastoral prog. So I was, I, I, I perceived it. What kind of prog? Pastoral. Pastoral. Oh, pas pastoral. pastoral okay. Yes. Okay. I, I'm from Mexico. I say things wrong. Okay. And um, <laughs> and also, I, I I do remember thinking that guy that plays the bass is fucking brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> And and then I I sort of I don't remember much. I remember thinking that woman really has some pipes, and then I left. So not not a great start. And so this is a mea culpa, right? right? So when when Ken suggested this, I was I was a little bit apprehensive because I I had that vague alcohol driven memory. So I spent the last few weeks really studying the record. And uh, as somebody who makes records of my own and, and who really is, loves music, I, I actually took the trouble of transcribing some of these songs and really getting into them because that's how I can understand them. I, yeah. I don't even own the record. I just want to be upfront about it. I can't show you anything because there's nothing. And um, I, I will say as a, as a first thing before I, I even made just some short notes that I need these things to read, but I will say that structurally, I love the bookends of the album trip to the fair and the title are absolutely great songs the two in the middle we'll, we'll discuss them in a second so it's kind of like in, in a way like metal for pink floyd where the bookends are like super awesome and then in the middle it just doesn't work for me but it doesn't sound anything like metal so this is what i wrote i just wrote some quick notes and i just want to read them because um 
I was really impressed by this stuff. So uh, Trip to the Fair, I wrote Gorgeous Piano Intro in E Minor. Then it goes to G Major 7. This is a, this is a theme in your music, I noticed. You guys have some really cheeky chord movement that I really love. That D major to C sharp major to D sharp major, beautiful, all right? And it's a four-minute intro that completely blew my mind. And then you enter this 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 weird, like, it's an A major, but it's kind of like it wants to be an A5, and you start singing. And that's when the song takes, your, your voice is so nice that it kind of takes away a little bit of the danger. Your voice is so soothing that I, I am imagining a crazy carnival. Some Something's going to go down. But now you start singing, and now I'm, I'm feeling happy. <laughs> I, I call that and he his, doesn't usually uh, like happy so take i don't like happy but your 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 vocal you have a very strong a vowel that i really like like most people when they sing ah it's a little it's not like you 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 do it's incredible and then i call this the exit from the pursuit to the village of the smurfs this is how i relate to it because everything is now chill it may still be dangerous but that that doesn't seem very certain anymore but then annie and i need to ask you this because you explained this was actually a real thing somewhere in the lyrics you say that your head spun and hit the ground i would like you to explain what the hell that was about because it, everything was going fine but then you hit your head but then everything is still okay so i was a little bit confused wouldn't that be the three scorpions i don't well maybe i don't know but I, <laughs> I'm just saying, as a listener i i, I was it seems to me like you're playing tricks on me. Like like you were trying to make me think that it was dangerous, but it was all false alarms. Right. But the music is so brilliant. I love the vibe solo. It, all these waltzy three fours, you know. Hmm. The 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 and again, the, this this is a thing that I, I don't know very much about your band. I don't know who wrote the music. I don't know if you wrote the melodies or or if somebody else wrote them or if you arranged them. I, I don't know much about it, but I have to say this composition is solid i love it yeah. it really is very moving and i was very ashamed that you played it live and it just sort of went over my drunken head so this is like my my apology to you and the rest right. of the guys <laughs> the um i really like this song then things uh, okay so vulture fly high i share your, oh, your oh. lack of enthusiasm about it <laughs> To me, it has a sort of a Vegas cabaret thing going. I think John Camp slides in the bass and the C are interesting, but it's very, I don't know, Broadway. I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's, it's um, obviously the sort of thing is what a lot of people like. I'm not one of them. <laughs> and um, I think the two of us. Great. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and, and honestly, one thing that I found very distracting is the little choppy chords on the piano. I think with, with the vocal melody that you had, if the piano had just been more dramatic, like if it hadn't committed to the, it must be happy. For me, it would have been better. This is, but this is my taste. Okay, this is just entirely subjective. So I, I didn't particularly love this song, especially given the title, because it's, it's it's always great for me when I get a chance to to hear artists be a little bit more mordant about what is happening with critics, because it's very easy to tear somebody down. It's very hard, as you know, to create something. So I I I thought your vocals are are great, but they're a little bit too happy for the subject. So that was it, it just confused me a little bit. I I, I didn't love that. So, hey, real quick, Luis. Yes. I was, I was driving this today and I had this album on in the car and Vulture Fly High was on. And I looked up and a, a turkey vulture was flying over my car. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So may, may, maybe it has some kind of aphrodisiac properties that we don't know about. The culture. I don't know. But um, all right. Then we get to Ocean Gypsy, which everybody seems to love, right? Personally, I love the vocal <laughs> melody, but I am not a big fan of ballads, right? So I don't have much of a chance with this one. Right? For me, also, I know you explained it, and thank you because I was going to ask. Um, that you use a different keyboard to play strings. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, especially now, I mean, I'm, I'm not old enough to have been there when this happened. But when I hear those kind of keyboard sounds, it's like if Velveeta could make an, a noise, those strings sound like that. It's very cheesy to me. I don't, 
I don't love it. I, I would have preferred actually, I, I hear in my head as I, as I listen to this, I don't know, something different. E even a Meltron would have been great. Mm. Right? But your vocal is really angelic. And, and if you don't know this, you should know that angelical vocals is a code word for Anthony Ferraro to be weeping with joy. So you have no <laughs> idea how happy he is that you're here. And I'm very happy to have met you because I think you're a lovely human. <laughs> <laughs> but he he is really infused by this kind of singing. So this is this is great, and I, I'm very surprised that Richard Blackmore loved it. But it's awesome that he did, and yeah. I hope you got, you got some cash thrown your way, even better, right? And then we get to the title track, and I honestly I cannot say enough good things about the tune. I mean everything about it. The betrayal has these fantastic bass hooks in addition to all the orchestral stuff going mm -hmm. on. The little modulations you guys do in half steps, the minor thirds. Again, I don't know who writes, but great, great, great. The, yeah. the orchestration is really fantastic here, as Ken pointed out. And um, I don't know, I don't know exactly. I'm, I'm not sure because I've been listening to it in YouTube. But when you get to the Sultan, I think it's like a G sharp minor. Uh, it's a really nice change. It's, the chord movements are just incredible. The love theme, to quote um, Alex Lifeson of Rush, you know, when he used to play uh, La Villa Strangiato live, he would just go into this section, we just keep changing. And then he would just go into the microphone saying, I will not give you the key. I will not give you the key just to best with, with, with Getty Lee. You guys are doing that. It's very difficult to, to, to find yourself harmonically what is happening. I love it when that happens. It's beautiful. It, I am really, really... I mean, when I say I'm impressed, it's not to say that I expected anything. I, I didn't. I'm just saying this is really, really top notch. And and, and I have to say, Annie, um, and not to blow smoke up your ass, but seriously, sincerely, um, I don't think you chose very easy vocal melodies. Well, I, I didn't. Write, I didn't write the music. Exactly, um, but, yeah. but you but you destroyed it in the best way possible. You killed it. Yeah. Some of these vocal melodies are very, very hard to do yeah. because some of these chord movements are not what you're normally accustomed to hearing. Yeah. You know, yeah, like, I was, like I was trained by an opera singer. So well, I, I so I didn't I didn't realize I had five octaves until I went to this 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 woman. But Michael Dunford, who's who, who was the main writer on this, but everybody else uh, in the band also contributed some of the music as well. Yeah. Um, he 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 always yeah he used to play uh, like a demo for me. He said, "Listen to this." I said, "That's my God, I'll never do that. It's too high." I said, "Of course you will. You got five octaves." But <laughs> and he just, but he knew what he he just loved my voice so much. He knew what to write, you know, for me to sing. Well, well that is brilliant because I want to I want to emphasize that not only do the, do the chord movements have these really like chromatic thirds, where there's for example they play an E major followed by a C major, mm -hmm. so there is a G natural and a G sharp. So they have this, this weird, and you are just floating over this in the most amazing way, which is very unusual to hear. But then when the record finally ends, you hit that high note. Oh, man. That A sharp <laughs> or whatever that is. And again, it's not just that you hit that note. It's that you own it like it's nothing. Flawless. She also teases it five It's a beautiful way of... of of, of of capping what is otherwise an incredible composition. And yes, maybe maybe there could have been less crickets. Maybe it could have been this, you know, hindsight is always 2020. Yeah. But I I think it's a fantastic song. Yeah. And I, I say that sincerely from the heart. I am I, I couldn't be more impressed. I've never listened to your records. This is the first record I hear. Right. I really studied it though. So yeah. I, I did transcribe it and I I spent some Andy, time. You have to forgive him. He's too busy listening to John Anderson's first solo album most of the no. time. <laughs> no, don't believe um, that. I would like to point out for the record that Anthony has been given a restraining order by John Anderson. <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and he Johnson. insists that I should love this man. And I, I, I don't know him. I don't dislike him, but I really don't dislike his stage persona. So I don't listen to him. In any case, your work is nothing like Anderson's because this was really, really, really very well put together. And um, even the songs that I didn't like, I think 
uh, the vocal performance was great. And the, the bass work is great everywhere. It's, it's not common to hear a bass player play solos over the verse of a song. Yeah. But that's what this, well, that's what John Kemp did for the vultures, right? This is this is very it's almost like Keith Moon's drumming. Yeah. Keith Moon just drums crazily over the vocal part and then he plays a break straight. So Kemp was kind of doing that in a in a so it, uh, I was very impressed by that also. And um and I so, think Terry Terry was the best drummer really because it could have been somebody that was a bit more busy, a busier. And then it would have been, yeah. Well, and it, and yeah. He, he just knew where, where to sit with everything that he did, yes. did, and he was perfect. We were, you know, the the five of us in that band. But there's no, there was nothing like it, really. It was, it was great. Hey, later on, you had Gavin Harrison playing drums, right? No, he he was well. Yes, actually, later on, you're right. He was he. Um, gosh, that was in the eighties. Yeah, we were yeah. the first band that he played with. Actually, toured with. Wow. Yeah. Well, That's Anthony's boyfriend. Well, you know, I mean, Gavin he, Harrison is not exactly a, a minimalistic player. He's nope. uh, so, uh, he pretty. He's he's pretty brilliant unbelievable. In his own way, right? Yeah, we saw him last year in Germany because we we headlined the Night of the Prog, right? Uh, in Lorelei, and and they were on. Um, he's, we was there with Pineapple Thief. They were on before us, and he's playing. I mean, it's just it's like Steve Steve Howe as well. If you watch, watch Steve Howe playing his guitar it's like like it's just like <clears throat> it's like liquid it's it's just it's just like so it's, it's just it's like if I, when i sing a high note when i sing high notes which are easy to me i have there's no effort in it and some people can just play the same way like steve howard just this plays this unbelievable it just pours out like liquid and 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 gavin's the same you watch him and, he, and he's just like he's like he's Connected, they're they're this, all the drums are connected to his body. You know what I mean? Amazing, yeah. brilliant. So it was Annie, Annie, this when we first played that he was going to go far. You know. So Annie, this has to be very nostalgic for you. This, this is going to be just like in the seventies. So you're surrounded by a bunch of male prog nerds. But the only difference is we're we're not living in our parents' basement anymore, and we've right. showered since then. So you know, it's. Uh... <laughs> So Annie, where does Shahrazad sit for you as far as oh god, I love it. I love it. And... Well, I think that um, you know, I didn't listen, I don't know why, but I, I didn't listen to the Carnegie Hall album for several years properly. I didn't really I don't know why. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. And and then I, 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 I don't know what else to say. I don't know why I didn't really bother to listen to it. And then uh, uh, maybe what was going on in my life at the time, you know what I mean? And then I listened to it and I thought, oh my God. Then I listened to Sherazard and I thought, oh my God, it couldn't be any more perfect, mm -hmm. really. You know, there was nothing, nothing in it that was wrong at all. You know, and it's it's live, you know, what a great live album. For me, Carnegie Hall is the best Renaissance album mm -hmm. because it has all of the iconic pieces and the best version. I mean, what's you know, what's better than that version of Ashes Are Burning or you know, yeah. or Shahrazad? I mean, it's yeah. just there. I mean, Renaissance as a live was, was a great live band, mm -hmm. and that to me is one of the all time great live albums and one of the great live rock live yeah. albums. I think the sad the sad thing I think is that um, the record companies at the time didn't think to film. Mm -hmm. So we've got you know the the the, the Albert Hall should have been filmed. Carnegie Hall should have been filmed, and I don't know why they weren't. I don't know why that didn't happen. I think another so bit then, of charm to that live album is uh, your, your some of the some more of the charm of the Carnegie Hall live album is your rapport with the crowd and you're laughing with them. Right. I just love that. It's just so yeah. it's so personal. You can tell you're having a good time. Yeah. Uh, as a consequence of Mr. Golden's advice, and believe it or not, I, I take his opinion very, very seriously sometimes when it comes to music. One I did listen to that version of that, the live Shahrazad from Carnegie Hall. Yeah. And I think in addition to the performance, which is absolutely brilliant, after you destroy with that note, <laughs> destroy. Then, then, <laughs> then you just very politely say, thank you. <laughs> to me, it, it, it is the icing on the I, cake. I it, not, it is. I wasn't asking anything. <laughs> it, it was. It was. It, it's so. It's. It's almost like 
<laughs> it's like you're taking the piss in the best way possible. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can we go together? <laughs> so brilliant. I love it. So I um, I love it. I love that. I lo I like that live version better than the record. Oh yeah, me too. Absolutely. It's it, it, it delivered oh, better. I think yeah. that in the, in the studio record, you can see that it's a work that has been digested, but is not yet yeah. like for live, as you know. And when you uh, get... Yeah, I think we should have gone out with it. We, should, we didn't do that, though. We usually recorded and then went out on the road instead of the other way around, you know. Yeah. Um, I have a question. I have yeah. a question for you. Um, I love the live versions that I've heard of Ashes of Burning where Andy Powell came out as a guest. And was there any thought at any time of adding electric guitars to the band? Well, when I first joined the band, let me think what Mickey was playing then. I think Mickey, he, was, I think Mickey was I playing the guitar, wasn't he? Um, or was he playing acoustic? I think you, um, had some, you had some electric guitar on Prologue, I believe. Yeah, yeah, but it, Rob, yeah, Rob but, what, his name was. Well, yeah, that was Rob, Rob Hendry, I think, that played. Right. Um, but I think when I joined, I think it was electric guitar. And then, um, let me think about this. And then there were some changes in the band, a few changes. Um, we still used the electric guitar. We were, I mean, we were playing in Germany three weeks after I got the job, and that was like scary as hell. Um, and um, but we I, we had a guitar then, and then Miles Copeland came into the picture, and he he could he could see that there was something there that needed to be changed, and something that was going to be really really big. He could see it. Yeah. So what he did was he fired everybody in the band except me and John Tout, and he kept on Michael Dunford as the writer. And so we we built a band around me, uh, me and John Tout. Um, and the first one to come in was John Camp, I think. It was quite difficult trying to, when we did, we did the auditions, um, I think John and I were playing something like Prologue and a, a bit of something else what that we had um, to, to play to a bass player. But he, obviously John was meant to be in the band, so he got the job. Um, and then... Terry came in um, and then we found an amazing guitarist, a wonderful person as well. He was such a lovely person. Um, and what was he called? A Mick, uh, gosh, this is where I get annoyed when it's something important and I can't remember his name. I know he was called Mick and he was, he lived in Cornwall and he was just a wonderful personality. He could sing, phenomenal guitarist perfect for the band perfect and um and so we were going down to see my mom and dad because i was living with miles copeland at the time you know miles copeland and um we, we went to cornwall and he and so he came down with us to pick up his and mick came down with us um to pick his stuff up and then we we went and we dropped him off and then in Bodmin I think it was and then we went to see my mom and dad and then we got a phone call he was in a car crash and died no oh. yeah it was heartbreaking it was just it, it was terrible um he had so much talent um and then that's when Rob Hendry came in the band um and he was with the band um and then actually Rob was in, yeah, when, when Miles was around, actually, yeah. And then we, we decided after prologue that we should we should go back to having an acoustic guitar in the band. And we brought Mickey Dunford, Michael, back into the band. And that's when it started to soften again. You know what I mean? It, it worked better with the music, really. But it, And he was the main songwriter, right? He was the main songwriter with Betty Thatcher, you know. Did he write, there. but what about like, like, I mean, for example, I mean, John John's keyboard parts are unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, did John, I assume John wrote his own parts. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he, I mean, he arranged. Yeah, Michael wasn't writing parts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think sometimes he didn't get as much credit as he should have done, but that's another story, you know. That happens a lot, No, it used to happen a lot. I don't think it happens as much now where people don't get the credit, you know, but... Um, yeah, no, John was a, a phenomenal um, 
piano player. Um, and then John Camp wrote a couple of songs as well. And Terry Sullivan wrote the, some of the parts, important parts, the beginning of Song for All Seasons, which was another incredible song. It was one of my favorites as well. So, um, but I don't miss the electric guitar. I think we brought it back in the eighties and I didn't like it. I didn't, mm. you know, I, I, just, I just didn't like it. I didn't like the way I dressed either. <laughs> <laughs> the 80s were the 80s. <laughs> that was a big mistake. We should have stayed where we were, you know, and uh and progressed naturally rather than trying to come up with another Northern Lights, which was that was when the things started to go in the wrong direction. You had a you had a top 10 hit with that, right? Number seven it got to, yeah. Oh. Mm. Yeah. In England. Yeah. yeah. It, it seemed interesting that, as I mentioned before, you had like this stronghold in New York and Philadelphia. Yes. Were there other parts of the country where the band was was happening, like really happening? I, uh, uh, Rochester, New York was another place. Uh, Bernie Kimball, I think. But, but was he called Bernie Kimball? Yeah, something like that. His name was, uh, he used to play us a lot up there. And of course, Ed Sharkey was uh, the main oh, person in Philadelphia, you know, yeah. um, and and Alison Steele, of course. Um, we got airplane Washington, not so much on the east coast or the west coast, right? Um, but so, I think that we um, we just um, our touring was um, mainly on the east coast. Um, that's it, 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 kind of, it kind of reminded me of, of Nectar. I don't know if you if you. I know if, Nectar. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were sort of the same way. They're very, very popular in the Northeast U.S. Yeah. And, you know, Nectar could come in, play the Academy of Music, Palladium, um, and uh, and they'll go out to St. Louis and, you know, playing in a club. Yeah. So, you know, so it was yeah. that kind of a thing. Yeah, I mean, we opened up for Steve Martin in San Francisco. Really? Yeah. <laughs> that is crazy. And so many and, levels. And, and it's the audience, it was a beautiful dinner theater. It was absolutely gorgeous. And uh, we went down really well. And they wanted an encore, but we weren't allowed to have an encore because we were going down too well. <laughs> am, am, I, am I crazy? That happened, that happened with um, also uh, Fleetwood Mac. We played in Rochester. And it was when we were really at the height of our career, and 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 they were doing really well as well. And it, we we did a, like a, a I don't like it when you have to do a, a co-headlining thing because you know psychologically you're still going on first. You know, mm -hmm. it's, and, and it's it's kind of an odd thing. But we went on first, and it was an amazing, amazing, amazing show, and um, never forget it. And uh, we, we so we came back on and did Ashes of Burning. Of course, it lasted a long time, as you know, when we did it live. And um, yeah, the the plug they they pulled the plug on us. <laughs> oh, wow! I, I was told it was Mick Fleetwood for the plug. And everybody, everybody booed, but when they came out, everybody went. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> How little. <laughs> Soon they forget, you, you, know. you know how you can pull the plug and make Fleetwood? <laughs> Give him sheet music. Mm -hmm. He'll <laughs> stop playing immediately. <laughs> Andy, I, I, am I crazy, but I, I have vague memories of Renaissance being booked at the Nassau Coliseum. Is that possible? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's uh, that's when I brought my mom and dad over. Uh, my mom and dad came over um, to New York and came to that show. And we had... Uh, Super Troopers, you know the you know the big, the, the giant lights that we used to have back then, yeah. and then and and and, and Nicky Sholomon used to do our lights for many many years. Um, it, he set it all up so that the lights went on my mum and dad, you know, and they got and they had to stand on. My dad loved it, you know. <laughs> what an amazing thing! Oh my god, yeah, yeah, we did play there. I'll never forget that one. <laughs> Yeah, great audience. Fantastic. Oh my God, we played so many amazing places. Gosh. Just Very special band. Them, you know. Fantastic. Very unique.
Well, we're so happy you joined us tonight. I mean, this uh, yes, made made this episode all the more special. And it's, <laughs> yeah. it, it's always it's always great talking about a special album, but then when you have one of these special people that made it all come to fruition, yeah. it's even better. Yeah, it's exciting, really. I mean, not just yeah, I think the seventies are my favorite time for music, to be honest. Seventies. So many of my favorite bands all made great music during the seventies, including Renaissance. Right. Yeah. Can I can I ask you a question, Annie? Yeah, I, I'm. I, I like. I, I I preface by saying this. I don't really follow your career very well. Are you working on anything right now? Well, we've been working. Uh, we yeah, we, we've still got the band together. It's basically um, an American band now. They're great musicians, and we've got our own ten piece orchestra. Ooh, um, nice. Yeah, we we have a new CD that we just um, released. It just came out, and we play. We did that last um, October. We did the town hall. And we recorded the Keswick. <laughs> um, and uh, what what I wanted to do, because I didn't know if we were going to tour again, um, I wanted to um, put a, a, a few of my solo pieces in there um, and with the orchestra. So that was made it a different, it, we called it the Legacy CD. So, uh, so that's out. But yeah, no, we've still been working. We went to Germany and Brazil last year. Um, we've done very well in Brazil. I recorded out there last uh, my birthday, 75th, 75th birthday. I recorded a song I wrote with a guy called Flavio Venturini, who's, who's quite well known in Brazil. Oh, yeah. So yeah, we're still working, but um, there's everybody wants to tour now. So I, I kind of was talking to the agent. I said, let's let's do another tour at, at this year, this fall. And he said, I need the, uh, oh, there's no there's no venues. They're all taken. Because everybody wants to tour, and all the venues that we've done in the last five years were all taken by other bands. I, so, I have a question: Is there anything unreleased studio-wise that's just been sitting in the vaults, like leftover tracks from the seventies, eighties? Uh, probably. Um, I, I, I mean, I've got a big box of tapes somewhere, and interviews, and, and studio stuff yeah i mean i really need to go through them i don't know whether they you know because they're tapes i don't know what they'd be like now but no you know just the cassettes kind of thing but no um let me think no no there aren't really no no we did we we, we just did, did enough for an album uh rarely had anything left over that i can think <laughs> of at all and some of those extra tracks, there were a couple extra tracks in the 80s that showed up on yeah. the, the I mean, and Yeah, I things. mean, Michael and I got a, an album together in, in 2013 called uh, Grand in Ale Vento. And yeah. uh, we decided that we wanted to write something that was um, a, a little like the, the feeling of, of Turn of the Cards, that kind of going back into that kind of feeling. You can't go totally because you don't have the same people, you know, in the band. And so, um, you know, that there's there's some good songs on there, particularly I think there's one um, called uh, Symphony of Light, um, which is, uh, I, I wrote about, because I, I write the lyrics, it's about uh, Leonardo da Vinci, because I'm also a painter. I don't know if you saw anything in the background here, my my painted guitar in the back, no, I, I'm, I'm a painter as well. So that you know, we, yeah, still, still singing, basically, um, and um, going to be doing prog stock. You oh, know, yeah. prog stock. Yeah, uh, it, it, but I'm not going to be singing there. I'm going to be just showing my art. I'm yeah. going to be there. I'm going to go up that Saturday. Oh, I'll see you there then. I'm going to. I be will come say hello. There. Yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And one of my bands is playing. Aziola Cry. They're playing. What are they called? Aziola Cry from Chicago. Oh, okay. They're playing there on Saturday. So it's the three piece. They're pretty good. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, listening to some music and just and just concentrating on my art and talking to people about my art and things. It's a nice town. Rutherford's a nice town. So I'm not sure I've been there actually. Maybe years ago. But I don't I don't know if we play what what we used when in the 70s, of course, we did all the universities, colleges, didn't we? But is there is there are there big big theaters there? Uh no, it's actually right right in the shadow of Giant Stadium. Oh, is it really? 
Oh, is that where it is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do I get there? Wow. That's so that's this side of New York. It's mm -hmm. it's New Jersey, but it's up it's near New York City. Yeah. Okay. Across the river. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, I one of one of my first Renaissance shows was at Colden Orato Auditorium at Queens College. Queens mm. College. Mm -hmm. I was going to Queens College. I think that was 1978. So, Bruce, do you do you know Bruce Eder? Who? Bruce wrote a Bruce wrote a great review for All Music of Shahrazad, and he wrote a lot of reviews for All Music. And he's a he's a music he's a music critic. Right. I remember, okay. I remember I remember Bruce went to Queens College. I remember meeting him online to buy tickets for Renaissance. Oh. <laughs> so. He gave a beautiful review of uh, of the album. His name rings a bell. Yeah, Bruce Eater. Yeah. Well, once again, Annie, thanks so much for joining us today and Ken for picking this uh, great album to do an album study on. And uh, we hope to see you on Sea Tranquility in the not too distant future once again. Yeah. That's why I'm an old woman's hour. <laughs> well, yeah, we, we have to first find all women. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. you, you as well, of course. That's called the Eddie Haslam show. Yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> all right. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for watching this uh, episode of In the Prog Seat, very special episode with Annie Haslam. And I want to thank Ken and once again for picking this uh, great album today. It's all about Scheherazade. So for those of you watching down in the comments below, let us know what you think of this album and uh, tune in in two weeks for another episode of In the Prog Seat, where we'll be talking about some of our favorite album, uh, Prague album covers, right? So that's the kind of uh, theme for the next episode. And then after that, we'll hop into another album study. So thanks, everybody. This is on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube all together. All the, all damn, the time. damn time. Well, Chuck Alvarez, Chad Hutchinson, <laughs> Anthony Ferraro, Ken Golden, and Louis Nasser, and most importantly, Annie Haslam, IMP Pardo. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you in two weeks here on In the Proxy. Take care.